my lovely little gemstones, it's Afira, and today I'll be reading Self Love Chapter 8 by Parallel Monsoon. Chapter 8 Aftermath. In the aftermath of the aftermath, Thomas takes some time. He plays Animal Crossing with Patton, gives him the grand tour, and it's no surprise that Felicity is his favorite. The next house down is Tad the Frog, and Thomas has Patton close his eyes, makes it a surprise, and he's a little worried, maybe, that it might come across as crass or even hurtful. Patton peeks, squeals at a pitch mice would flinch from, and Thomas grins. Wait till you meet Lily, he says, and soon enough Patton is miming a gurgling death from cuteness toxicity. He goes for walks with Logan. It's not the rainforest, but his sleepy little neighborhood is teeming with more life than Thomas knows. Logan catalogs the things they see, records it all for later research, squirms shy when Thomas marvels at the precise, lovely little sketch of a palmetto bug in flight. He listens to music with Virgil. My Chemical Romance, Fallout Boy, Dashboard Confessional. They give each other try-hard goth makeovers and giggle at the idea that Thomas ever thought himself mysterious and brooding. And when the nostalgia is satisfied, they find new bands, new songs. Emo adjacent at first, melodic hardcore, first wave, punk pop. Later they make a game of it, the weirder the better. Thomas is thrilled to discover that pirate metal and wizard rock are not only real, but exactly what one would expect. They set aside the white foundation and smudged eyeliner and try out pastel punk and glam and beauty. Why not? If they don't like it, they can always change back. He keeps writing with Remus. Seven notebooks in, and the bird is now a demigod thing that floats bloated and hungry on the outskirts of the universe. Or it is the universe, and it means to eat itself. Thomas isn't sure how much further it can go, but he's excited to find out. Between chapters, they watch horror movies. No torture porn, Thomas will never be able to tolerate things like Hostel or Audition. But they watch every child's play movie and Cabin in the Woods and Tusk, and Thomas finds it easy now to laugh at the gory absurdity. Remus is scarier than any B-rated slock, and there's something reassuring in knowing the real monster is on his side. He starts writing with Roman. Fan fiction at first, riffing off stories already told. They make Aurora the dragon. No true love's kiss, just a smoldering inner fire that lets her overcome the curse to save her kingdom. Snow White meets the dwarves and learns that they too are victims of the queen, forced to give up their precious gems they mine. Instead of cooking and cleaning, she trains alongside them, and in the end leads a rebellion armed with pickaxes and shovels to reclaim her throne. They take the pressure off the princes, and learn that new and wonderful things can grow from even the most well-worn tale. Roman still doesn't sing, but sometimes he hums as he writes, soft and low and tremulous. And Thomas never points out how Roman's royal garb is in flux. The sash still red, but darker now. Garnet. The very same shade as the curtain in the middle school auditorium. And Thomas isn't sure how he ever forgot. Instead of gold, his braids and buttons are mother of pearl. They spark iridescent, but in the right light you might almost think them gray. Roman is changing, little by little. And Thomas can't wait to meet the person he's becoming. Thomas takes some time. Takes the time to talk to each of them of dreams and goals, of wanting, and reassures them that they can. The words are easy enough. Convincing them? Not so much. It's a novel idea to the sides, that this life is theirs, too. But they talk about responsibility, to both yourself and to others. About compromise, about balance, and what it means to be one, and what it means to be many. Gestalt, something that is made of many parts and is greater than the sum of them. He tells it to Logan, and has the pleasure of seeing Logan's eyes go wide as the truth of it hits home. Oh, Logan says. That. Yes. Thomas nods. Yes. With coaxing and care and patience, they talk. And in the aftermath of the aftermath, Thomas makes some changes of his own. He still can't adopt a dog. He travels too much, and in truth, he's not sure he's ready for the responsibility. But he can foster. His first is a tiny mop named Tater Tot. Thomas has her for two weeks before it's time to send her on to her new home. And yeah, he bawls like a baby. But Patton is there to cry with him, and they both agree that it was so, so worth it. He doesn't have the time for a college course. Instead, he finds an amateur astronomy club on Meetup, and joins them every other Tuesday with his brand new telescope in hand. They drive for an hour to watch the Perseid meteor shower on the hilltop, far from the city lights, and Logan's quiet awe is matched only by Thomas's own. Thomas isn't quite ready to audition again. That wound is still raw, though Thomas already knows that he will, and soon. That dream is his too, and he's not going to let it go so easily. Even joining a local theater group doesn't sit right, and anyway, he's had his fill of hairspray and fiddler. He's mindlessly scrolling through Facebook when he sees it, an ad for a volunteer position at the local community center. They're looking for someone to teach creative writing to at-risk kids. 
It's terrifying. What does Thomas know about children? It's perfect. Virgil works them both up to near tears before the first session. The kids will hate him. He'll stutter and stammer and make a fool of himself. The parents will hate him. They'll learn he's gay and run him out of town. He won't be any good at teaching. He'll damage the kids, ruin their love of reading and writing for life. Thomas breathes, tells Virgil to do the same, and steps into the classroom with a smile and no idea what he's doing. That first time is rough, yeah. It's also fantastic, and only gets better. The kids are young and vibrant and ready to make. They meet once a week to tell a new story together. It's Thomas's job to provide structure, a prompt, and a framework to build on. Sometimes the story is the sort of fanciful fairy tale that Thomas himself had written at that age. They might start with a witch hiding away in the dark green depths of the woods. What is she doing? Making a potion. What does the potion do? It opens the door to fairyland. Why does she need to go there? Because the fairy king kidnapped her cat and she's going to get him back. Sometimes it's about butts and burps, because they're kids, and that sort of stuff is comedy gold. There's a superhero. What's his power? He has super stick boogers that can capture bad guys. What's his weakness? He can only use them when no one is watching because he's too embarrassed to pick to his nose. What's his code name? Major McSchnozface. Maybe Thomas isn't as mature as he thought, because Major McSchnozface slays him, lays him right out, and he lets the kids spend the rest of the session drawing the hero in all of his sticky, nasty glory. And sometimes it's both, and the tale of pretty Penelope the puking princess will forever be one of Thomas's proudest collaborations. He types it up and gives a copy to each of the kids. The author's page has a dozen names, and the last reads Thomas R. R. Sanders. He's blown away every session by his class of mad munchkins. A little jealous, and intimidated even, because these kids, his kids, they're going to change the world someday. And it turns out that giving back, it doesn't always have to be a sacrifice. It's not always deprivation and making do with less so others have more. Sometimes it's puppy kisses and your shyest kiddo raising his hand to suggest that maybe the cat was the fairy king all along. For Patton, dogs. And the chance to love in a clean, uncomplicated way. A chance to be needed, just as he is, without worrying that he's overdoing it or getting it wrong. For Logan, stars. And the chance to learn in the structured way that he thrives on. A chance to share his knowledge with the assurance that the people around him are just as fascinated and eager to know more. For Remus and Roman, stories. For Remus, the chance to practice restraint, but also to be appreciated as he is. For Roman, the chance to be a hero. Not a dragon-slaying prince, but a real hero. The kind that changes real lives for the better. For Virgil, Virgil doesn't ask for much. He just wants Thomas to be safe. Virgil wants Virgil to be safe. Or he wants to feel safe. And those aren't the same thing, not really. You can be safe without feeling like you are. And it's in that gap between perception and reality that Thomas sees opportunity. Virgil balks when Thomas brings up the idea. Digs his heels in hard, but Thomas expected no less. It's another case of their fears feeding each other. Fear of the new, fear of change, fear of failure, fear of success. But there are fears mixed in that are unique to Virgil. And those at least Thomas can soothe. Late night cuddles and endless promises that this isn't about getting rid of Virgil. It's not about fixing Virgil. It's about narrowing that gap so that Virgil can have an easier time matching reaction to risk, so that he can feel safe when he is safe. Thomas goes to therapy. He's not ready to try medication, though he doesn't rule it out. His therapist tells him about cognitive behavioral therapy, sends him home with worksheets, and Thomas and Virgil fill them up together. They learn to spot the patterns of disordered thinking and replace them with new ones. Recruit Logan to help them spot distortions and things. They get better. Not quickly, not easily. It's work. And sometimes Virgil backslides and sometimes Thomas does. But they have each other's backs. They watch out for each other. And Logan watches out for them both. It's their life. And it's getting better every day. One morning Thomas wakes with a groggy snarl for the alarm. He eats breakfast with Patton and lets their newest foster, a drooling, saggy senior named Chewbarka, that just might be his first foster fail, out to pee. He checks in with Logan for the day's schedule and agrees with Virgil that the week is starting to feel a little overbooked. They decide that Saturday will be a free day, and Thomas is fully intending to spend it watching Parks and Rec in his jammies. Just because some things change doesn't mean everything needs to. He wanders upstairs for a shower, Alone, thank you, Remus, lathers up and tries to think of a good prompt for the writing group this afternoon. He's rinsing his hair when he snaps rigid, hands still raised, heedless of the soap running into his eyes, strains to listen, heart racing, hoping. It's soft, small. Say what goes around comes back around. Be 
fiancé, not Brittany, rough and more than a little off-key, distracted, like the singer doesn't realize they're singing it. Slowly, Thomas starts to move again, and if his eyes burn and it looks like he's crying, it's only the sting of the shampoo. It's their life, and it's getting better every day. But there's still that pinch behind his belly button, a sense that while things are getting there, he's not done yet. For Patton, dogs. For Logan, stars. For Remus and Roman, stories. For Virgil, safety. For Janice, Thomas doesn't even know where to start. Thank you all so much for listening. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to make sure you don't miss the rest of this series. If you like what you hear and you want to read more, you can find the link to the fic in the description. If you want to check out other podfics I've done, you can click on the playlist linked on the screen. See you next time!